Hi there, another Saturday, another weekend. I hope you're enjoying it. You're not having to work and maybe you've got a little bit of downtime. And I hope also the week has been good for you. Thank you so much for all your support and your encouragement with my DIY project. If you have missed out on it, have a check out on Instagram and Facebook, and Twitter as well. I decided to refurb a very old bench that we had in the garden. So uh, Dremels and, and what were they, sanders became the tools of the trade. I actually learned quite a bit over the last couple of days, but uh, I'm really pleased with the result of it. I think I'm looking for my next project now. But this evening, it's another story for you. And I've chosen yet again from the lovely collection by Maeve Binchy. It's called A Few of the Girls. And it's a collection of stories that were put together um, following her death. Sadly, she died in 2012. But these stories hadn't been seen before, uh, only if one had been alive at the time she wrote them, because they were published in the Irish Times and some of the newspapers and other papers and magazines around at the time before she wrote the first of her 20 best-selling novels. So uh, I've chosen another story from here. They're quite short and they're quite sweet, but this one is called The Mirror. So probably best I haven't got a mirror, but when I put my glasses on, it's getting a bit loose actually, these glasses. You really see me poking them up over my nose every time I'm trying to read. But anyway, if you're sitting comfortably, I will begin. The Mirror by Maeve Binchy. It would have been all right if on the day of the viewing, she hadn't overheard the couple talk about how valuable the mirror was. Jerry would never even have considered taking it otherwise. It was enormous for a start, very old-fashioned and rather over-fancy. They were each to choose one piece of furniture from their Aunt Nora's possessions before the auction took place. Jerry's sister had taken the piano, her brother had taken the rocking chair, and she had been about to select a little octagonal sewing table when she heard that the mirror was worth a lot of money. Jerry loved a bargain. The others used to tease her about it, but she said that she got such genuine pleasure from knowing she had bought something valuable, they surely couldn't begrudge it to her. So she told nobody about the overhead remark and she said that the mirror was what she would choose. We don't want a huge mirror, her husband Sean had said. Why don't you take the bath with the funny legs? asked her son Shay, who was 18 and into weird ideas. It could fall on somebody and kill them said her 16-year-old daughter, Marion, who would disagree with anything on earth that her mother suggested. But it was Jerry's aunt who had gone to the retirement home and Jerry's choice when it came down to it. So the huge mirror was taken down from the hall and delivered to their house. Aunt Nora had been surprised. You don't have a hall big enough for it, dear, she'd said. This was, of course, true, but Jerry hadn't wanted it for the hall. She wanted it as a big showpiece in her dining room. She knew just the place and there would be candlesticks beside it. It would knock everyone's eyes out and gradually she would let slip how valuable the mirror was and how rare a piece, how lucky she was to get it. She wouldn't need to say that to their neighbours, Francis and James. They would know at a glance. And what a wonderful glance that would be. Even though Jerry didn't like to admit it to herself, she was very anxious indeed to impress this couple. They seemed to have effortless style and confidence. Jerry would enjoy their reaction when they saw the mirror at the dinner party. Where are you going to put the mirror, dear? Aunt Nora wanted to know. Sometimes her aunt irritated Jerry. She seemed to know everything and be right about all subjects. In the dining room, she said, and waited for the objection. She hadn't expected it to be so forthright. You can't be serious, said the old woman, who'd settled herself into the nursing home with a small selection of perfectly chosen pieces around her. Aunt Nora did have very good taste, that couldn't be denied, but she was also very, very dogmatic. That's where I'd like it, Aunt, Jerry said, with more confidence than she felt. She wondered why she felt so defensive, so apologetic. Jerry often asked this about herself. She was a perfectly acceptable looking woman of 38. She worked in an office five mornings a week. She went to the gym two afternoons a week. She was married to Sean, a civil servant, a man who loved her and as much as we would ever know anyone loves us. She had a handsome son, Shay, who would eventually get his act together and realize that he had to work for a living. She had a discontented daughter, Marion, but all girls of that age hated their mothers. She had a nice house and she worked very hard to keep it all looking well. Jerry would go miles to get an inexpensive rug that people would think was much more classy than it actually was. But when you thought about it, was this a crime? 
Was this something that should actually make her feel guilty and humble and in front of an elderly aunt? Why is that a bad idea, Aunt Nora? She asked, keeping her temper. My dear girl, nobody has a mirror in a dining room. You must know that. Jerry hadn't known it and she doubted if it was true. She listened patiently while her aunt, speaking from the point of view of another generation, told her it was unwise to let people see their own reflections. They spent ages titivating and making faces at themselves in the mirror and totally lost interest in the art of conversation, which is what a dinner party should be all about. Everyone knows that, Jerry, Aunt Nora said disapprovingly. Jerry decided to be very understanding. This was an elderly woman who had just been forced to leave her home. Allow her to have the last word. Pretend to agree. I'm sure you're right, Aunt Nora. I'll have to think of somewhere else to put it. She lied soothingly. Aunt Nora snorted. She'd been around a long time and she knew that Jerry hadn't a notion of changing her plans. By chance, that evening on a television programme about interior decorating, someone made the remark that you'd never put a mirror in the dining room. It unsettled Jerry for a moment, but she rationalised. It was one of those old superstitions, like not walking under ladders, some fuddy-duddy thing about having to have antimacassars on your sofa. The mirror arrived in Jerry and Sean's house and was hung over the mantelpiece. It sort of dwarfs the room a bit, doesn't it? Sean said tentatively. You have no idea how valuable this is, Jerry implored. Oh well, all right then. Sean was all for an easy life. I'd have loved the bath. It was like something from a horror film, said Shay wistfully. It'll fall down in the middle of their dinner party, mark my words, said Marion confidently. But Jerry took no notice. She planned the party relentlessly. Sean had met some fellow who was in the running to be an ambassador, and Jerry insisted that he and his wife would be invited. She planned for happy hours how she would drop this piece of information in front of Francis and James. She'd also invited an old and rather tedious woman who was leasing her castle to Americans and a man who was involved with the development of film. It would be a guest list that would impress anybody. All that and the new mirror. Francis and James would be stunned. The children were being well paid to serve the meal money to be handed over discreetly when the coffee was on the table. And Shay and Marion had said a courteous goodnight to the company, but not before then. To Jerry's great disappointment, nobody mentioned the mirror when they filed into the dining room. She just couldn't believe it. Nobody. Francis and James had been in this house before. They must have noticed it. Perhaps they didn't comment on it out of sheer jealousy. The young wannabe diplomats must surely have been in smart places with heirlooms and antiques before. Maybe they just expected such elegance. The elderly castle owner and the future filmmaker said nothing also. And so the meal was served. Jerry noticed that Frances was constantly moving her hair from behind her ears to in front. Twice she took out her lipstick and once even a powder compact. Her eyes never left her own reflection. She heard nothing of what was being said. The film man frowned at himself darkly, held up his chin with his hand, sucked in his cheeks and kept bringing the conversation around to liposuction, laser therapy and the unfairness that it should only be women who had a little nip and tuck under the eyes. The old castle owner sank into ever deeper despair and asked for neat whisky. I had absolutely no idea I looked like this, she told Jerry four times. I'm a perfect fright. I shouldn't be allowed out. What a depressing, depressing discovery. The young diplomat couldn't see himself, but he was so alarmed by the way everyone opposite him was looking over his shoulder that he kept turning round to see what was behind him. His wife said to him that he'd better stop acting so nervy if they were ever going to land that plum post. Sean just kept talking good-naturedly, smiling at her across the room, proudly, and noticing nothing of the disarray. Jerry had never known such failure and letdown. Perhaps it was just too dark, the whole thing. She must light more candles. And she stood to do so. But when she did so, she saw her son Shay reflected in the mirror. He had worn a collar and tie, part of the exorbitant price she was paying for his good behaviour. And she noticed that for every glass of wine he poured, he was drinking one himself. Her eyes hardened as she sat down. 
Perhaps you could just leave the decanters on the table, she said in a voice of steel. One of the candles was dripping wax, so Jerry went to sort it out. Again, she looked in the mirror to see what she had fondly believed to be the most elegant dinner party in Ireland and see how it was progressing. This time she saw Marion, who had worn a rather shorter black skirt than Jerry would have liked, being fondled by the lecherous filmmaker, and Marion was not running away from him. She was smiling in a very upsettingly knowing way. Jerry sat down abruptly. Nothing was going right. Her aunt had been correct. Nobody should have a mirror in their dining room. It was a disaster. Why had she not understood? Frances had momentarily stopped pouting at herself in the mirror. She was smiling at Sean, a very fetching smile. Sean, will you please come and pour my wine for me, now that Shay has stopped being wine waiter, she said. And Sean stood up obligingly. This was the moment that the silk flowers on the mantelpiece caught fire and Jerry leapt to her feet. Everyone's eyes and attention were on the activity. Tears of rage and humiliation were in her eyes, and as she doused the candles and rescued the charred silk stems, she saw Francis smiling at Sean and reaching out her hand for his. Jerry had thought that there was nothing else that could go wrong. She believed that she had been as upset as was possible for one human being to be. She looked down at her square, practical hands. She wished that they were long and narrow and white and had long pink nails. She wished her watch looked too heavy for the fragile wrist as Frances's did. But Sean had managed to move away from the perfectly groomed long white fingers and he was sitting back in his place. Well done, Jerry, firefighter, he said. It wasn't exactly the role that she'd wanted to play, nor the words she'd wanted to hear, even though he spoke them with praise and love. And the mirror didn't get burned at all. He was cheering her up. Please may he not mention the awful mirror and that it was valuable. Please let him understand that she had totally changed her view. There was so much she had to sort out. Like Shay's drinking, Marion's sexual awareness, the fact that her admired neighbour Frances was coming on strong to Sean, and that the two other guests were still staring at themselves gloomily in the damn mirror, and that the would-be diplomats were in the middle of a major row. Jerry took this mirror from her aunt's estate, Sean said proudly, or proudly even. Jerry closed her eyes. How very kind of you, Frances said patronisingly. Jerry's the kindest person in the world, Sean said. Jerry opened her eyes. She stood up slowly and she walked to her aunt's mirror, which she was going to sell tomorrow. She looked deep into it and she saw the wreckage of what had seemed an important dinner party. She was a better informed person, a better armed person now. She knew much more than she had known four hours before. She knew that whatever old fool had said you shouldn't have a mirror in the dining room was right. She knew that you could never impress James and Francis, no matter how you tried. She knew that the old trout with the castle was self-obsessed and would be of interest to no one. She also knew that the filmmaker was a pathetic old lech, driven to groping teenagers to prove that he wasn't over the hill. She knew that the future diplomats wouldn't get to first base with the Foreign Service or with each other. She knew that Francis, elegant Francis, fancied Sean, her Sean, and that she couldn't have him because Sean loved Jerry. Jerry hated to make a bad investment and maybe the mirror had been a poor choice. If the sewing table hadn't made its reserve at Aunt Nora's auction, she would take that. Sean was helping the guests into their coats and waving them goodbye. He came back in and stood behind her as she looked in the mirror. He put his arms around her shoulders. The mirror was a mistake, Sean, she admitted in a small voice. He smiled into her hair. Maybe, but it wasn't a total mistake, he said to her and held her tighter. I don't know, she wasn't convinced. Well. Don't the pair of us look fine in it, he said. Doesn't that make it the bargain of the century? The end. Hope you enjoyed that one. And I hope you'll be able to join me next Saturday for another story and keep in touch with me in the meantime. Any form of social media, messaging, texting, tweeting, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, I'm on it. <laughs> and it's always nice to keep in touch. And don't forget the blog as well. Lovely to have your comments on the bottom of that. And I'll always write back to you. Take care of yourselves, stay safe and uh, stay in touch. I'll see you soon.